Hey everyone, so uh, this is my professional development presentation. Uh, my name is Kia Mir Mozafari, and I hope you enjoy it. So uh, first covering what literacy meant in the past and, and how it kind of evolved into how we currently talk about it. Not that any of these past definitions are no longer relevant, which is simply that the definition of literacy has evolved and, and become more nuanced over time. So really back in the day, we just used to be like, are they literate or not? Like, can they decode, you know, can they read sentences or not? And I think that was, you know, uh, justifiably a main focus, especially when society did not have that many people, many people who were literate. Uh, that evolved to content area reading. Um, so that's when you're discussing, okay, do they have the skills? Can we, uh, where they can look across a variety of topics and can they get uh, essential understanding and insight from um, as they go from subject to subject, right? So those uh, so content area reading is really focused on helping students read across topics or readers read across topics. Um, then you went to content literacy. So content literacy expands on content area reading, but it also includes the idea that um, the the students' uh, uh, expression and their um, and how they receive and process is also very much part of literacy, right? So not just uh, understanding in, in the sense of, oh, I'm reading about different topics, but also can I engage with this? Can I process this in different ways, right? So that um, so content literacy kind of expands to include that interaction expression as part of the framework for literacy. And then, of course, I'm, as I'm sure many of you are familiar with now, uh, disciplinary literacy um, is, uh, you know, what uh, I, I believe it was coined by Vaca himself, um, is, refi is refines it further to really talk about whether students and readers can put themselves in the frame of the mind of a specialist or professional in that subject area or in that content area. So can they think like a scientist? Can they think like a mathematician? Can they think like a uh, writer or, or, um, or a lawyer who's reading or, you know, reading with a critical lens? Can they put themselves in these different mindset mindsets? Can they essentially code switch with regard to mindset? Um, that is disciplinary literacy, where, where you can go into that professional or specialist frame of mind. So how does this basic literacy, you know, of uh, phonemic awareness and, and, and having the phonics skills really develop into disciplinary literacy? Because it's one thing to be able to read. It's another thing to understand and make meaning from what we read. So the five pillars of um, uh, literacy are uh, phonemic awareness, which is really just recognizing and identifying the different sounds in speech. You got phonics, which is matching that with the graphic aspect of it. So graphically, do you see these are the letters or the letter groups? And do you know which sound corresponds to that? Um, then you got fluency, which is where the phonemic awareness and phonics is, is so uh, habitual or, or mastered that it becomes an unconscious process. And you're not doing that really when you're reading a passage fluently, if it's within your you know zone of proximal development, if it's comfortable for you, you should be able to read without decoding much, if at all, um, really shouldn't be more than 5% of the time or so. So that's when you're reading fluently is when that the decoding is an unconscious process and you're focused on taking the meaning of the text. You're not focused on decoding, right? Uh, and just as uh, you may have inferred already, uh, reading fluently depends on having both the sufficient vocabulary and also um, really having mastered the phonics skills that are necessary for that the level of difficulty in that passage. Uh, vocabulary, uh, this just <laughs> serves every other uh, dimension here, uh, which is knowing the meaning of words, right? And that, of course, helps facilitate fluency, but also uh, helps with every stage and, and noted here. In comprehension, this is when uh, we get to um, synthesizing and under, uh, understanding and connecting, right? So this is when the reader understands the message, can connect the text or the media with related or prerequisite ideas in their mental schema, right? So that's when like, oh, I get it. And you know what? This connects to that idea. Or, oh, I see how that, you know, this skill built, built into this one and prepared me for this. When you start making those kind of connections, when a reader starts making those connections, that's when they've got into the comprehension stage. Um, and, and we'll get into the strategies for these later, but first we're gonna continue just a little bit on the relevance, um, 
on how these relate to the stages of literacy. So again, as we mentioned before, it's literacy is so much more than just decoding. Um, and that's evident by the fact that by definition, comprehension and fluency are focused on whether a reader is able to uh, extract and synthesize ideas, right? And connect them to other um, related uh, topics or skills. And it's important to know that these five pillars are interrelated, but not necessarily linear. Now, it might even be taught in a linear fashion. That's not to say that it has to be, and especially for those of us who are in the middle school or high school stages, it's important not to teach it in a linear way because uh, students are fully capable and need to develop uh, the more higher order skills, and they can do that while they're still developing the basic reading skills. Um, so for example, um, uh, we know that the content of a reading and the process for understanding it are two sides of the same instructional coin. Um, and that students who are engaged in active hands-on learning activities and who are responding to higher order thinking questions and TDQs, they uh, outperform their peers significantly. Um, so that, and, and if you notice like hands-on activities, responding to questions, well, you don't need to have your phonics down to do those things. Um, so you can definitely work on uh, literacy skills before a student has uh, the prerequisite phonics for uh, decoding uh, a reading on their own. So you can still work on these higher order skills while bringing along and developing the essential skills if your student lacks it. Um, so there's no reason to go to have to go in that in order. Uh, you, really, it's an interconnected web. So you want to bring them all along at the same time. You don't wait until one is done until before starting the other. That's not the way to go, especially not with uh, older kids. But even in elementary school, I would say that still applies. So teaching strategies for these five pillars. Um, so for phonemic awareness, you can use rhymes, word games, for example, like, you know, uh, I said like koala. All right, find another word that starts with K or starts, find another word that ends with a, uh, you know, and that helps them like the k, 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 uh, 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 like they can find other words that have those elements in there and that's helping them develop their phonemic awareness. Um, if you have older kids, uh, not even that old, you know, I think I wrote my first haiku when I was in uh, third grade. So you make haikus and that, of course, gets them very conscious of the syllables because the haiku is so syllable focused. Um, that can definitely be done in their uh, L1 and their original language. Um, and uh, also explicit instruction on how words are constructed. Um, this can also get students to focus on the different parts of a word and also by extension, how those parts sound. Um, so for phonics, you can practice like IDing the sounds uh, and of letters and letter groups. For example, like the letter F and the letter group GH make the same sound. And you can ask, like you can make fun quizzes based on like that kind of uh, stuff. Uh, you can also make like do charades or picture matching, you know, um, so that they can start uh, uh, associating the words with uh, the visual. Um, you can use uh, worksheets that ask students to complete uh, spelling a word or, or fill in the blank. Um, and, you know, again, uh, rhyming words, um, uh, it's still a good strategy for this as well. Uh, so for fluency and vocabulary, uh, one of uh, a great strategy is just dramatic reading and get that intonation because the intonation really communicates and conveys meaning so well. And so it's actually a really important part of fluency and also important part of uh, presentation. You know, we don't want to be monotone because um, we're, we're actually, honestly, we're communicating less when we're monotone. So have that intonation, you know, it's really, really, if you, if a, something sad is happening, make it sound that way, you know, and, and, and model this for students um, and then have students practice it themselves. And then they can really, uh, and that's going to help them remember the meaning of words and, and build their vocabulary faster and more effectively as well. Uh, other strategies are um, a class word wall that they can complete collaboratively as they go through reading, um, using repeated reading strategies. So like reading first to decode and then revisiting for understanding, right? You can, you can do that. Um, you can, of course, you can supplement text with pictures and videos or play games like Taboo, which, which build vocabulary again through, uh, uh, incentivizing them to get synonyms and antonyms right for those words and also a lot of fun um and comprehension you know i 
rubrics is a great uh, strategy for uh, building comprehension and also for facilitating peer review and self-evaluation, which again, can help them um, comprehend more. And, uh, and just the clarity of a rubric, just having that anchor, having that, that guide and, and, and the text uh, that Kenny has here talks about it in, in the sense of having it like be like a, your GPS. You know, a rubric really tells you where you're going and how close you are to getting there. And, and for students to understand that really builds those independent skills, gives them agency, uh, super valuable things. Um, so there's rubrics for comprehension. Uh, there's also activating the background knowledge. Um, this activating background, background knowledge is not only valuable beforehand, but also during and after a reading. Um, you want, because, because it's all about connecting. And yeah, our mental schemas are networks. The, the human mind is a network. And, and so background knowledge doesn't just help them connect at the beginning. It also helps them deepen connections um, during the reading and afterwards as well. So uh, that's another great comprehension strategy is to make sure that you are activating background knowledge. And also uh, repeatable activities can help with comprehension and with refinement. So for example, uh, having a running blog or journal that students complete. Um, so if they're reading a book, it can, it can be the, the, I believe it was the Daniel's, yeah, the Daniel study, um, you know, grounded that their the blog in an essential question as they were reading Stargirl. And uh, um, yeah, like students can keep uh, elaborating and diving deeper into uh, a certain question or a certain task within new context and with new information. And uh, in the Daniel study, it was shown that the students really, uh, the length of the responses um, became much, uh, much longer and also more clear and in depth. Uh, with with less and less prompting over time because students were getting familiar with the task but the task was still fresh because it was with new information and in new context as they went through the book so can these stra strategies be oh my goodness i did a typo uh, can these strategies be facilitated by technology yes it, it shouldn't say instruction there please please note this says technology all right thanks for for doing that so Absolutely, can be facilitated by technology. Um, I used to get in, in, like intimidated when people were like, "Incorporate technology in your class," you know. And um, I think it's just because technology is such a catch-all phrase, and and as a result, it's so poorly defined and and a little scary as a result because it's a little unknown. Like, what does that exactly mean? Um, but after this first year teaching, I really just realized the obvious. I hope it was obvious for you all. It was not to me, <laughs> but that technology is really just making the things that you do easier. And that's the whole point of technology, right? So for example, we just talked about the running blog uh, in the Daniel study. Um, that's a better form for that is online because it, it captures it, um, the history of their responses um, all in one place. It's easier to look at as a teacher and as a student um, and see the progress. It also facilitates peer review more easily, right? Um, students can access that uh, uh, quickly and at home or at school, and they can do a peer review. You know, uh, it just makes the delivery and the uh, and seeing um, the history of it much more efficient and um, and also yeah, and also easier to access. So that can all just like the same thing could have been accomplished through class journals, but then you have to like collect them and hand them out, and then well that puts limits on when it can be accessed and how long it takes to access it, right? So here, the technology is expanding when it can be accessed to any time if the students have computers at home. And um, it can also make it, how quickly can it be accessed? Well, right away, you know, um, assuming the computers are there in the class. So uh, it can really make that process more efficient. Um, it can also be used for formative assessments. Again, it can make it much more efficient. So instead of handing out a sheet of paper, which is a short quiz, you know, handing it out can be, take as long or longer than the quiz itself, right? So uh, by doing Google Forms, they have the computers on, uh, at their desks, you know, just a one to two minute comprehension check and you can move on with your lesson. And also uh, it can, you can go so much more deeper and be some, have some, such a richer assessment because you can use multimedia, um, you know, by using a computer, uh, uh, a, a Google Form quiz or a computer quiz rather than like a paper quiz. Like how can, 
a paper play audio for you or show you a video related to the question. Like you can't. So you can have you have many more options for how you quiz your students. Um, also, when you use uh, a little bit of technology, and again, it's, just, it's what you would do anyway. It just helps you go faster and deeper into the same thing. Um, so, and again, there's so much specialized software that also may suit your needs, like Nearpod or uh, uh, Pear Deck, uh, for example, um, or Kahoot. Um, that's very popular in my school. But like, you know, if you want to use it, use it. If not, just see what you're doing and see what how what you do already can be made easier. Uh, our last topic here is going to be meeting the needs of diverse learners. Um, so uh, just off the bat, let me just say uh, this there's no such thing as a comprehensive list of how to meet the needs of diverse learners because by definition this is going to be individualized and every person's different so there's always more that you know more that to learn about this and, and it's going to really be informed when you know your individual students but these are just a few strategies um, but by no means are they comprehensive or meant to be so one thing that stuck out to me as very important is to avoid labels just you know really focus on the progress towards the goal uh, it's totally okay for your students to have different goals uh, within the context of the curriculum, uh, within the framework of the curriculum, rather. Just that that's okay because everyone starts in different places and has a different um, uh, learner profile. So that's to be expected and to be the norm, right? So their point is to work towards the class goals, the curriculum goals from that point, right? And uh, uh, it's important to note that you can run the risk of having some students feeling not accepted if you know things are expecting if you're taking if one takes a cookie cookie cutter approach and expects all students to be on the same in the same place well the students who are in that place will feel valued and feel accepted while the students who are not in that place could very easily not feel that way and you really want to avoid that because you know not having confidence discourages uh, effort discourages um, paying attention, all those things. It has so many negative consequences. So you want to make sure your feel, students feel accepted and supported in going towards their, um, uh, their, their learning goals. Uh, another thing is be accepting of dialectic differences in writing and expression. So uh, I think Vaca said it best. So language differences should not be mistaken for language deficits, right? So we all have our own dialect. Everyone does. Now it's true that like some dialects are privileged, right? Um, and that's the current reality. I know I know that a lot of tests are trying to address that. You know, SATs are trying to address that problem because SATs privilege a certain dialect. So does GRE and all that stuff. Um, doesn't have much to do with how successful or expert you are in the content matter, right? So they're trying to, those tests are currently trying to not privilege those dialects, but they still have a long way to go. So given that, um, it's very important that students know that code switching into different uh, dialects is just an academic skill so they can express themselves effectively in different mediums and contexts. And it's something that all of us have to learn, right? Even a, someone whose dialect is in a privileged category, well, maybe they want to relate to people. <laughs> so they, of course, they, of course, also uh, benefit from learning code switching, right? Maybe just a strictly academic sense, they're already pretty good to go there. But people are social animals, people want to work with each other, people want to go to different places and do different things. So they still have a need for um, uh, learning the skill of code switching in different uh, mediums and contexts as well. Uh, be mindful of how cultural of how culture can impact classroom behavior. So classic, this is an example I really like, which is like, individualistic versus group um, mindsets, right? And some cultures are more individualistically, individual minded, and some cultures are more group minded. In the US, uh, we tend to be more individual and we prioritize, we value competition and individual accomplishments. Meanwhile, in other cultures, um, there's a more of a group emphasis and those students may feel it will be more normal for them to work in groups and to, and to accomplish as a group, not really be focused so much on their own individual uh, um, accomplishment. And so they, students like that could be, uh, group students could feel a little uncomfortable in a very individual, uh, mindset classroom and vice versa. So these are things to be mindful of. And there's no right or wrong. You want to just make sure that the classroom is such that, um, both types of learners can, uh, enjoy the class. And, and that's just 
an example of two two things. There can be so many other uh, types of uh, behaviors that are passed down through our culture or heritage. So that's something to try to learn and be mindful of. And also uh, to, to end this, uh, begin learning about students' background, knowledge, and cultures. You know, you can try sending surveys home to get information. You can have uh, many classroom activities or even just warm-ups where students talk about themselves or their interests. This information should then inform lesson planning because um, you want it to be relatable for students so they can feel motivated and uh, also have the rubrics so they can have the clear goals. So if you have rubrics and you have uh, uh, and you're connecting it with their, their heritage and their background knowledge, awesome. All right. Thanks all for listening. I appreciate it.